Yeah, so my name is Renard, and I'm going to be talking to you about adjunctions, um, which are sort of the, the real sort of meta theory behind monads. So my goals for this talk are totally selfish. Um, I want to sort of show you this pattern repeatedly, and then the theory is that you're going to start seeing this uh, everywhere in like your everyday life, and then you're going to tell me about all the cool adjunctions that you discover. Um, now Saunders McLean famously said, adjoint functors arise everywhere. And I think that's true. They arise in, everywhere in, in category theory, in all over mathematics and programming, and just sort of in, in everyday life. Um, the Wikipedia definition gives us sort of th this intuition for, for what an adjunction is, and it says that uh, an adjoint functor is a way of giving the most efficient solution to some problem via a method which is formulaic. Right? It's sort of a mouthful, but it sounds really useful. Yeah? And if we reason sort of from the other side, we can say that uh, dually it's finding the most difficult problem that some formula solves. <coughs> All right, so before we can talk about adjunctions, we actually have to understand some preliminary category theory. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to turn on the category theory fire hose, and you guys are just going to, going to uh, absorb it. OK, <laughs> here we go. OK, the situation when we have a function, f, uh, that goes from A to B. So A and B are types. A, B, and C are types here uh, in Scala. So we have a function f that goes from A to B, and we have a function g that goes from B to C. Then we have a composite function, g compose f, that goes from A to C, right? And the definition of that is just, you know, lambda of x, which is of type A, goes to uh, g of f of x, right? Uh, and so what we say that this diagram commutes, and by that we mean that all the paths through this diagram are the same. Calling f and then calling g on the result of that is the same as calling g compose f on, on the a that we started with. And then composition of functions is associative. Uh, that is, this diagram commutes as well. So all the paths through this diagram are the same. It doesn't matter if we do f followed by g compose h, uh, or h compose g, sorry, or if we do g followed by f compose, uh, g compose f followed by h. Right? So it doesn't matter which of these paths we take through this diagram, uh, they're all the, the same function from a, a to C. And then for every type, there's going to be an identity function that does nothing. And what it means to do nothing uh, is that uh, to compose the identity function with another function uh, is the same as, as just that function. So these two diagrams commute, uh, f, composed of the identity is f, and the identity composed of f is also f. Okay, so far so good. So in general, uh, a category has some objects. It has some arrows between those objects. It has composition of arrows, which is associative, and has an identity. And that's it. You now all know all of category theory. So, um, so we've already seen one category, which is the category of Scala types and functions. The objects in that category are the Scala types. The arrows are Scala functions. The composition is just function composition, which is associative, because you know if we compose f uh, and g and h, uh, we just always get this composite function lambda of x, f of g of h, h of x. Um, and then there's an identity arrow on, on every type. There's an identity function, which when comp composed with any other function, doesn't do anything to that function. Okay, so no, that's one category. But not all categories have functions or even function-like things as arrows. Um, Scala actually forms a category in more than one way. Uh, in addition to the category where, where the arrows are, are functions, there's also the category where the arrows are subtype relationships. Okay? So uh, uh, here in this category of Scala and subtype relationships, there is an arrow from the type A to the type B exactly when A is a subtype of B. Right, so arrows point up. Um, and then if B is a subtype of C, there's an arrow from B to C. And then there's a composite arrow from A to C because you know, A being sub B and B being sub C means that A is a subtype of, of C. So uh, the subtype relationship is transient. And this kind of category in general that has these sort of sub-relationships or a, an ordering uh, is called a partially ordered set or a poset. 
Uh, it's partially ordered in the sense that there's not necessarily an arrow between any, between any uh, two objects. So for instance, uh, int and string are not, they don't stand in a subtype relationship between each other, right? So there's not necessarily an arrow. So it's a partial order. All right, so, uh, oh, and also note that there's at most one arrow between any of the two objects, right? So these, the arrows in this category are unique. And there's an identity arrow on every type because every type is a subtype of itself. That is, the subtype relation is reflexive. And if we have A sub B, B sub C, and C sub D, you know, we also have A sub C and we have B sub C, uh, B sub D. Uh, and all of that amounts to the fact that A is a subtype of D. Right, so all the paths through this diagram are the same, and we say that this diagram commutes, so composition in this category is associative. And in general, any sort of partially ordered set uh, forms a category like this. Uh, for example, the integers form a category like this, uh, where you know if two integers a and b, uh, if a is less than or equal to b, then there's an arrow from a to b, or the arrows point up. And there's an identity arrow in every integer because every integer is less than or equal to itself. Cool, so that's another kind of category. Another kind of category is a category with only one object. So a category with only one object is called a monoid. Now, you might already know that a monoid is some type M, which is equipped with some binary operation which is associative. And that sounds a lot like a category, and in fact, that's uh, what it is. So the arrows in this category are, are like not function-like things at all. They are values of the monoid type. So for example here, x and y could be the numbers two and four, and if we're in the integer multiplication monoid, then y compose x is two times four, right? So for every uh, integer, there's going to be an arrow from the integers to the integers, and the composites are those I integers multiplied. Okay, so that's monoids. Um, oh, and a monoid also has identity arrows, uh, since it's a category. For example, in the integer multiplication, the, the identity arrow is the number one. And composition in a monoid is associative, as it is in any other category. All right, so x times y times z, uh, or x plus y plus z, like all of those things uh, are, are the same, no matter how you associate the operation. It doesn't matter where you put the parentheses. All right, so far so good? Cool. Uh, <clears throat> so not only is every monoid a category in its own right, there's a whole category of monoids uh, where the, the arrows are functions, uh, and those functions are monoid homomorphisms in that they preserve the structure of the monoid. Uh, for example, uh, taking the size of a list is a homomorphism between the list monoid and the integer with addition monoid because it preserves this relationship that the size of two lists uh, added together is the same as the size of the composite list. Uh, and we have the same situation with, uh, with posets. Not only is every poset or ordering uh, a category, uh, there's a whole category of posets. And the arrows between posets are monotone functions. Uh, for example, if we have one sort of poset would consist of, uh, of like the subset relationship and then there's the other one, which is like the integers with less than or equal to. Then taking the size of some set uh, is, is going to, so if x's is a subset of y's, then the size of x's is going to be smaller than the size of y's, or smaller than or equal to, right? So another kind of uh, category. But so if, if monoids are categories and there's a category of monoids, posets are categories and there's a category of posets, then there's also a category of categories. And the arrows in that category are category homomorphisms. That is, they are, are some mappings that preserve the category structure. And category morphisms are, uh, homomorphisms are usually called functors. Uh, so the situation is like this. We have some categories, you know, C, D, and E. And F will map every object in C to uh, an object in D. And it will map every arrow in C to an arrow in D. And it will preserve the composition. It will preserve the identities. Uh, and functors compose. Uh, so this diagram commutes. If we have a, a functor f and a functor g, we have a composite functor gf. Cool, so that's category theory. Great. Uh, so now that we all know category theory, we're all on the same page about that, uh, let's jump into adjunctions. All right. 
Uh, so we'll, we'll start with a, a simple example. Uh, so my idea here is that I just want to show you a bunch of examples and then you'll start to see the, the pattern. So there's a simple relationship in uh, integer arithmetic um, where uh, if we have integer multiplication and integer division, uh, those things stand in this kind of, kind of relationship, which is that for, for any three integers, x, y, and z, uh, if we, if we uh, multiply z and y, that's going to be less than or equal to x precisely when z is less than or equal to x divided by y. Right, so, um, so, so what this is really saying is that x over y is some integer, right? And it's greater than or equal to every z, which then multiplied by y again is less than or equal to x. Right, so that is x over y is the, the greatest z that makes the left side true. So just to take you through that sort of step by step, uh, let's, let's fix y to be some number. Doesn't matter what number it is. So it's like, say that's fixed. And then we take z and we start with something small and we start growing it. What's gonna happen is that this on the left hand side, uh, on the left hand side, uh, we're gonna start getting a, a larger number when we say z times y. A larger and larger number until at some point we go over x. And when we go over x at that exact point, uh, like the, the point at which we go over x is when z is uh, more than x divided by y, okay? Um, another way of saying that, if we just substitute x over y for z in the left-hand side and z times y for x in the right-hand side, then we get this sort of pair of inequalities. So we basically put the identity on one side uh, and, and see what pops out the other side. Uh, so, so we get these two uh, inequalities on the bottom, and the top one of those says that if we divide by x, sorry, if we divide x by y, and then we multiply by y again, we get x or less, right? So if we start with 10, we divide by three, remember this is integer arithmetic, so we have some remainder, and then when we multiply by three again, we get nine and not 10 we get something that is less than or equal to the x that we started with. And on the other side, if we multiply by y and then divide by y again, we get something that is greater than or equal to the number that we started with, okay? <coughs> so this is actually a relationship between two monotone functions. So f uh, here, you know, I've, I've sort of abstracted out the multiplication by y into a function called f and the division by y into a function called g. And if you'll note that these functions are functors. They are uh, endofunctors in the integers as a poset regarded as a category, right? So the less than or equal to relationship is going to be an arrow in that category. And then in this case, it points from the less to the greater. Arrow, those arrows point up, okay? So that's sort of the first time we're seeing this pattern. Don't worry if you didn't get this particular example. We're gonna see uh, some more. <coughs> so in general, uh, what we, what we have is, uh, is this kind of relationship between arrows. So th these arrows in the categories uh, stand in a one-to-one -one relationship, right? So f of z was uh, less than or equal to x precisely when uh, z was less than or equal to g of x, right? And if, if this kind of relationship exists, then we say that f is left adjoint to g, and together they form what's called a, an adjunction. Okay, so uh, since this should work for all x and, and z, we can actually pick f of z as our x, uh, and we can make, you know, the, the arrow on the c side, uh, we can make that the identity and see what happens, and then we get this situation where, you know, if we divide, like if we go g, g was division, so if we divide by three and multiply by three, we don't get 10 again, we get, you know, nine. We, we lose the remainder when we go divide and then multiply. Okay, cool. Uh, here's another example. Uh, so here, the, uh, the key symbol is some set of keys. Uh, just think of that sort of, sort of abstractly. And then the lock symbol is some set of locks. And then for any given uh, set of locks and, and set of keys, we have this sort of relationship that is supposed to hold. That is, uh, th th what I'm saying here is that 
whatever min keys and max keys, uh, sorry, max locks are, min keys is going to give me something that is less than that set of keys, and max locks is going to give me something that is greater than a, a set of locks. And those are going to happen at, th so this is a precisely when relationship. So when that min keys goes over that set of, set of keys, then uh, max locks is going to be uh, under that set of locks. So in order to, for this to work, min keys has to get the smallest set of keys that could open some set of locks. So it has to be the optimal solution to those locks. Right? So this is saying that min keys of some locks is smaller than any set of keys, uh, which when we go and, and get the, the maximum set of locks that those keys could open, we get you know, the set of locks we started with. Okay, so min keys has to get the smallest set of keys that could possibly open some set of locks. It has to be that optimal solution. And max locks has to get the largest set of locks that a set of keys could possibly open. So it has to be the biggest problem that a given set of keys could solve. Okay, so maybe that gives you a little bit of intuition for, for this. And another way of saying the exact same thing is that if we say max locks and then min keys of some set of keys, uh, we should get the same or fewer keys than we started with. And if we go, you know, min keys and then max locks, we should get a superset of the locks that we started with. That is, you know, if we have some, some set of solutions and we say, well, what are all the problems that these uh, solutions could solve? And then we ask, okay, well, what is the most efficient solution to all of these problems? We may get a more efficient solution than we started with. And conversely, uh, we start with some set of, uh, set of problems and we say, okay, what is the most efficient solution? And then we go, well, what are all the problems solved by this solution? we'll get maybe a larger set of problems than we started with. All right. <coughs> yeah. So in, in the slide where I sat, it said that you were talking about a place where you build a system that does that, right? Am I? Probably. Okay. <laughs> that <laughs> okay, I don't, I don't know. Uh, that's an interesting, interesting intuition. We'll maybe talk about that after. Okay, so let's see, this, uh, let's see this pattern again. But this time we're gonna go into the Scala category. So no longer working in post sets. So if post sets are not your bag, Scala maybe is. Okay, so, <coughs> so here what, what this is, is saying, so we have, we have the, these two functions, curry and uncurry. And what, what these two methods are, are saying is that there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between curried functions and uncurried functions. That is, if we have a function that takes a pair and gives us a C, so a pair of A, B, and gives us a C, uh, we can turn that into a function that takes an A that we could partially apply, so that it then takes a B, which gives us a C. And then uncurry goes the other way. It takes such a curried function and gives us the function that takes the pair. Okay, so this is saying that we can go in either direction. There's a one-to-one -one correspondence between these arrows in the Scala category. Uh, so the one-to-one cor -one correspondence looks like, looks like this. There's an arrow from A to B to C exactly when there's an arrow from A and B to C, okay? And if we sort of abstract that out and we say pair with B is a functor called F, and then a uh, function from B is a functor called G, then we start to see that this is a relationship among uh, functors. And, and here, uh, Another sort of intuition for this is that a pair with B is the most efficient answer to the question posed by a function that takes a B. Right, so it's very similar to the situation with locks and keys. And then a function that takes a B is the hardest question that a pair with B can answer. Right? And in general, when we, when we have sort of two categories like this, uh, and we have functors, F and G, and uh, they exhibit this sort of one-to-one -one relationship between arrows, that is, there's a one-to-one -one relationship between arrows from f of z to x and g of x, uh, uh, sorry, z to, to g of x on the other side, then we have an adjunction. We have uh, uh, this natural isomorphism between the, the arrows. <coughs> and uh, in the curry-uncurry uh, 
situ situation. Uh, so these are sort of two viewports onto the Scala category. Uh, so there's a one-to-one -one relationship between you know, the functions from the pairs and the, the functions into you know, other functions. Right? So th these stand in a one-to-one -one relationship. And we can capture that w a junction or that one-to-one -one relationship in a trait in Scala. Uh, so we say, well, uh, if we can implement this, then we have, then we have uh, an adjunction. And what it has to exhibit is that we can go from f of a to b, uh, sorry, we can go from functions that take an f of a and gives, gives us a b, to functions that take an a and gives a g of b, and we can go the other way around as well. Right? So we can, um, uh, uh, given one of, the, one of the functions, we can ask, well, what is the one that corresponds to that on the other side? Okay? Um, and these methods uh, are called the, the left adjoint and the right adjoint. I'm going to use that terminology later. And for the curry and uncurry situation, the left adjoint is just curry, and the right adjoint is just uncurry. And uh, if, we, if we pass the identity function to either one of those, we get an interesting situation. So let's see what happens there. If we pass the identity function, uh, then you know, one of the sides collapses, and what we get on the other side is not the identity function, but it's sort of the analog of the identity function like in the, in the other category, or across the adjunction. Uh, so here we get, uh, you know, if we, if we pass it into the left adjunct, we get a co-unit for a co-monad, the co-monad FG. And if we pass it into the right adjunct, we get uh, a, a monad, uh, we get a, a unit for a, co a monad, and in this case, it's the monad GF. And in, in our uh, situation with the curry and uncurry, uh, those monads and co-monads, you might uh, see something familiar here, that the, the, the unit is the unit in the state monad. So it's a function from an A to another function that takes an S and, and gives you a pair of A and S. Uh, and it's pretty easy to see what that would do. Like, you take your A, and you have to return a function that, gives, that takes an S and returns a pair. So you're going to just return the A that you got, and you're going to return the S that you get next, which is, uh, and you're going to leave that, uh, leave that alone. And then in the co-unit side, the implementation of that is going to, well, you have a pair. One of them is a function that takes an S, and the other thing that you have in your pair is an S. So you're just going to pass that S to the function and get your B. Right? So it's totally sort of, sort of obvious from the types what this does. Um, yeah, so we have, uh, we have the, these, these two constructions, FG and GF. Is there a question? Uh, the question is, do you always get a monad and a co-monad? Yes. Within any adjunction, if you compose the, the adjoint functors one way, you get a monad. If you compose the adjoint functors the other way, you get a co-monad. That's always true. That's kind of cool. Um, so, so yeah, uh, th these are the, the, the state and s state monad and the store co-monad. Uh, if you're not uh, that familiar with the state monad, uh, the state this this type is just a function, a function type, and it models a state machine uh, where the input s is the state before the machine runs, the a is the output of the machine, and the the s in the pair that you get back is the state after the machine runs. <coughs> And then uh, for the store uh, co-monad, uh, that's sort of like the intuition for that is that you have a store full of A's, and they're indexed by S. So given any S, you can get an A, and there's sort of a current S. Uh, so you can always get an A out by just asking what is under the current S, and then you can sort of move the cursor around. Uh, a cool intuition for this is imagine if S is like a pair of ints, and A is something like a color, then you have an, like an infinite bitmap um, that you can then, you know, that you have like a current pixel that, that you're looking at. Okay. Um, so the, the types tell us everything that we need to know about, about uh, the unit and the, and the co-unit. The implementations just totally follow from the types. In fact, we can generate the unit for the monad and the co-unit for the co-monad just by passing identity to curry and uncurry. Right? 
And if we just like keep turning the crank on this junction, we can get the join for our, our, the state monad. Um, so here I'm sort of annotating the, where the state monad actually is. But uh, if we just map our co-unit over the sort of the, the function functor, we get the, uh, the join for the state monad. Uh, right? Awesome. And then we can get a duplicate for our co-monad. Uh, oh, I, I guess I should explain what this join actually does. Yeah, so if you, ha if you have a, a state machine that returns a state machine when, once it's done, uh, join will take, uh, it will construct a new state machine that runs both of those machines. Uh, okay, and then we have a, 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 the store co-monad. So duplicate takes a store and it gives you a store full of stores where un, you know, under each uh, index is a store with a cursor at that index. <coughs> right, so, so why is that useful? Well, because if you map over that store of stores, you have access to every location of the index. <coughs> uh, yeah, so uh, if, you don't, if you're not that familiar with co-monads, uh, co-monads are basically the, 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 the dual or the opposite of, of monads. So instead of having a unit where you could go from, uh, sorry, this is actually backwards. It go, should be from A to M of A. Uh, so units should go from A to M of A and then bind, you know, it's like flat map. Uh, you have an M of A and then you have a, a function K which given that A can give you, can craft that M of B in there. But with co-monads you have the opposite. You can always extract an A out of your, of your W of A uh, and then extend uh, takes you know, some, so, some F, which is a, a, a W full of A's. And then this K will operate on sort of like the, the current uh, W of A, and it will, will be able to give you a B. And so it's called extend because it sort of extends that to a global computation. So that K may do some local computation in your, in your co-monad, and it'll extend that to a, a global computation. Uh, I'm gonna actually show you how, how that works. So yeah, Comanad extends a local computation to a global one. Uh, <coughs> so imagine you know, that, that we have a two-dimensional grayscale bitmap, uh, and which we can represent as a store uh, of, of uh, ints, which are indexed by pairs of ints. Okay, so the, the uh, left ints are the index, the, the, pixel, the locations of the pixels, and the, the right int is the color or the, the tone of gray for that pixel. So we can implement uh, a, a mean function, which, so if we have a cursor into the, you know, we have a current pixel in our store, we can take the mean of the surrounding pixels around that. So that's sort of a local computation. And if we extend that, then we get a low pass filter. So it will do the average, the mean ca computation across the entire image. Yeah? So that's, that's awesome. Uh, and in fact, we can do this again, and we can say, well, if we, if we extend the difference between you know, the identity and the low-pass filter, then we get an edge detection, right? So it's pretty cool that all of this falls out of a simple relationship between curried and uncurried functions. All right, so, th so that was uh, junctions in, in Scala. Okay, so <coughs> uh, here's another, another example of this. So let's say that we wanted to write like index of, which given uh, an A and a list of A's, uh, I'm glossing over the fact that you would need like an equality on A, but given an A and a list of A, can we find where this, this uh, A is located in that list? Uh, so what am I going to return here? Am I going to return, like, okay, if it's, not, if it's not in the list, what am I going to return? Like, I could return negative one, right? Like, do the, go the Java way. Uh, I could return, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, like, what could we return? Prob probably can't return anything sensible, so you'd have to pick something sort of ad hoc. <coughs> but uh, there's, this, there's this class of, of things called pointed sets. And a pointed set is something like super simple. It's just a type together with sort of a distinguished point in that type. You know, a, a, a sort of a default value, or a, you know, any, any value in that set really would work as the point. So for example, we could say there's a pointed int has negative one 
at the point. We could say that. Um, but the question is, can we turn any type, like int, into a pointed type in a formulaic, universal way that works for all types, making no ad hoc choices at all? Uh, yes, we can. Because uh, there, there, there is a functor that goes the other way. It's, it's called a forgetful functor, which, given a pointed type, will just give you the type and it will forget the point. Right, so sort of a simple construct, it will just like throw away that information. And that functor has a left adjoint, which is a free functor, which goes from, uh, well, this should, this should say it goes from types to pointed types. Uh, so I have that backwards. But yeah, so, so P should go from types to pointed types. So given any type, it should give us a pointed type without making any arbitrary choices. It should introduce a point, but it doesn't introduce a point of type x, it introduces a point of type p of x. So it's gonna give us a sort of a new value. And uh, what's gonna be true here is that p is going to be left adjoint to u, that is our, our free functor that finds the pointed set. It's gonna be left adjoint to our forgetful functor that forgets the point. And so there's gonna be an isomorphism between arrows uh, we have, on one side, we have arrows from P of A, that is the free pointed set on A to B. And on the other side, we're gonna have arrows from A to the, uh, to U of B, which uh, for U forgets that B is a pointed set. So we can simplify that side and say, well, it just goes to the set B, okay? So <coughs> this free pointed set P of A uh, is, it, like, what is that? Well, this actually defines what that is. So the adjunction actually finds it for us. Um, so whenever there's you know, a function from A to some pointed set B, um, then there's going to be uh, a function from the, our pointed set P of A, our free pointed set, to the pointed set B, which preserves the point. So it's, it's gonna be a pointed set homomorphism. Okay, and this should work for every pointed set B and it should work for every type A. So great. Um, <coughs> so we're gonna have this sort of isomorphism on, on arrows and the right adjunct in our adjunction is going to, uh, you know, take uh, functions across this adjunction and find the corresponding uh, function going the other way. Uh, and this actually, this right adjoint uh, uh, thing any implementation of this is going to be the free pointed set. So our free pointed set, we're just gonna call that P of A, and that is going to be, uh, it's gonna have a method which, given any pointed set and a function from A to B, it's gonna give us a value of type B, right? And this turns out to be option. Uh, because if, you know, we have an option of A and we have a pointed set, we can fold our option uh, given a, a, a function that, that takes you know, the, the thing that's inside the option. Like if we have a just, uh, then we can apply f to it. If we have a, not, not a just, if we have a sum, sorry, I'm in Haskell. If we have a sum, then we can apply f to that a and get our b. If we have a none, then we just get the point of the pointed set. So, and this will work for any, for any pointed set. So yeah, the universal pointed set that works the same way for every type A is option of A, right? So when we do index of, we return an option of int rather than an int, right? And so this is sort of the universal solution to that. Uh, and just to prove that this is actually the same as option, I can implement sum and none, right? So if I have sum and I fold that, I pass my, my A to the F and otherwise I get the point of the, of the pointed set. <coughs> and then there's a, a left adjoint, which uh, uh, isn't, all that, isn't all that interesting. Usually with adjoint functors like this, uh, one of the sides is going to be more interesting than the, than the other. One, one of the sides is like easy and the other one is hard. But if we turn the crank on our junction, we get the unit for our option monad. And if we turn it the other way, we get a co-unit for our option co-monad but that's not a co-monad in the Scala category, it is a co-monad in the category of pointed sets. 
And we can get the join and the extend for those uh, for that monad and that co-monad as well, just as if by magic. Um, and we can we can do the same thing again with like monoids. So uh, the question is like, knowing nothing else about a type, can we turn that type into a monoid? Well, yeah, because there's a forgetful functor from monoids to sets that just forgets that that type is a as a monoid and gives us the underlying type A. So here I'm using sets and types interchangeably. Uh, and so there's going to be a functor from types to monoids, uh, which is going to generate a free monoid M of A for any type A. And that's going to be exactly the same kind of situation where we have, you know, our free functor M is going to be left adjoint to the for forgetful functor U, which is going to, you know, be an isomorphism between arrows like this. We can simplify one side, and then we can say, well, we have this, this right adjunct mapping, and any implementation of this is going to be a free monoid. And that actually turns out to be isomorphic to list. So great, uh, we just generated a list uh, from, from the fact that we wanted to generate li uh, monoids for any type, uh, for any type A. Right, so, so this is a really kind of interesting that a list is, is really just anything that you can fold into a monoid. So given a ma mapping from the elements into the monoid, uh, you, can f you can fold the, the, the elements using the, the monoid. And this is a perfectly good definition of, of list. And then as if by magic, we can turn the crank on our junction and get the unit for the list monad, and we can get a co-unit for a list co-monad, uh, which is kind of cool. Yes? Oh, it's because A is monoid. How do you get an A out of a list of A if list is empty? You return the, the identity of the monoid. Uh, and if the list is not empty, what you have to do is you have to add up all the A's using the monoid, right? And, and the, this uh, implementation, the right adjunct of the identity, is going to do that automatically for us. And then we can get the join for our list monad and the extend for the list co-monad. Uh, so list is not a co-monad in the Scala category, it's a co-monad in the category of monoids. So as if by magic, we can get that, that out. Uh, and we can actually do this for any kind of uh, data type. Uh, there, there is, uh, so a most algebraic data types, at least the ones that are just sort of like products and co-products, uh, are going to be some free functor. And there's going to be a corresponding forgetful functor. And, and we're always going to have this uh, relationships where the free side is left adjoint to the forgetful side. So another cool thing about adjunctions is that uh, they compose. So if we, ha if we have F is left adjoint to G, and P is left adjoint to Q, then FP is left adjoint to GQ. Uh, and generally, it's enough only to know half the adjunction, and you can generate the other one. Uh, so if we know any two of F, P, G, and Q, we can find the others automatically. And in fact, there are some really good papers about, about this that I encourage you all to read and then explain them to me. Um, there, there's a paper called Generic Programming with the Junctions by, uh, by Ralph Hinze, and there's uh, this thing called Galculator, Functional Prototype for a Galois Connection-Based Proof Assistant. And Galois Connection is just uh, another word for, for a junction, but in POSETs. Uh, and yeah, so, so there's uh, work being done of, you know, just coming up with the junctions and then just turning the crank to like generate programs and generate data types automatically. So uh, yeah, in summary, uh, we want to look for adjunctions to generate problems that like naturally fit, uh, so generate solutions that naturally fit our problems, and yeah, also to generate problems that naturally fit our solutions. Uh, and adjunctions generally sort of resolve a tension between some trade-offs, uh, like with the, you know, picking like what to return from, um, from uh, index of, you know, there's like we don't want to return. Uh, you know, we, we, don't, we don't want to make some, some ad hoc uh, decision, uh, you know, because there's, there's now this tension between like, well, like, do I pick something that like might be useful for something else, you know? Uh, am I gonna pick something like step on someone else's toes? They might expect negative one to mean something, something else. And the adjunction just totally resolves that tension. It just takes that problem away. Because it's sort of, 
finds an optimal surface between the problem space and the solution space, uh, and then you can just, uh, just use that. So, uh, in summary, when, whenever we're looking for a beautiful, general, and natural solution uh, to any given problem, if we can express the problem as a, as a functor, uh, then we can just look for an adjoint and, uh, and find that beautiful solution. So adjoint functors are, are everywhere, I'm told. So, you know, let's, let's go and find them. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. Oh, is there is there a way to return? Uh, right. So, uh, where's that? Here. So you're asking if is there a principled way to like pick an integer here? No, I don't think there is. Uh, I think the only principled way of picking something to do here is to look for an adjunction, and and uh, you know see see what what it is that you actually want. Like what you want is some point, and so. You have to sort of like do this search in the problem space and say like, okay, what I actually want is for my set to be pointed. And well, if, if you want your set to be pointed, just go to the free pointed set and then you don't have to make any decisions. Other questions? Can we extend the concept of adjunctions to natural transformations and is that useful? Um, I, I don't know. Uh, that's, sh you should research that and tell me about it. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, question over here. Oh, the question is, uh, I'm sorry if I butcher your question, but the, no, the, the question is if, um, you know, we might have some, some point cloud and then uh, we, we wanted to map that into like a line in, through that point cloud, right? So like a, a statistical um, computation. Uh, is there an adjunction between those two? Like go into the, can you go back to a point cloud from a line? Right, well, I, I suppose with the point cloud, you could just like generate the cloud that is like all the points along your line. Uh, and that would, I think that would be an adjunction. It's just that it's super lossy. Uh, so yeah, you could generate like a free point cloud for a line, which is just all the points on the line. Uh, I don't know if that use, that's useful, but maybe. May, maybe the monad or the co-monad are useful in that case. Who knows, awesome, like, thank you. Uh, other questions over here? Oh, the question is, is either uh, one of these, uh, like is there an adjunction that, that induces either? Is that the question? Yes, yes there is. I actually had that on my slides before, but it takes too long to, to explain. So maybe I can explain it to you uh, after. But yeah, that's an adjunction between a, a product category and, and the category that you want the, the co-product in. Uh, and it's a left adjoint. So I've actually told you the whole answer, but. <laughs> Like you can generate either from just that, yeah. So uh, compress and decompress. Oh, is, is uh, compress and decompress also an adjunction? Yes, uh, and that's especially interesting for lossy compressions, uh, because when you decompress, you don't get the same data back, right? So then it's interesting. What is the monad there? Right? I 
don't know. That's cool. One more question. Rob, I'm going to take your question. Uh, yeah, so you can define a free functor as being f left adjoint to a forgetful one. Uh, I, I I don't really know. Like it's yeah, that's one way you could define it, but it's sort of a, a, a dissatisfactory uh, definition because it's kind of vacuous. Uh, but I, uh, maybe the only way that you could define like free and forgetful is just uh, using sort of vacuous terms like that, because because really all there is there is this adjunction, and we're just sort of attaching the these, these meanings of free and forgetful. Yeah. Okay. Right, we now have a 20 minute break till uh, 